My name is uh, Rick Twaniak, and I'm the uh, director for the DevNet program. And it's my honor today to introduce you to Marty Roche, who was the founder of uh, Sourcefire and the inventor of Snort, which is, uh, was an open source security uh, application product. Uh, and what we're going to do is sort of an interview style today uh, to talk to Marty um, about uh, his background, some of the things he did, uh, and how he got to where he is today. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and launch into it. So, uh, Marty, take us back uh, to the days back in 1998 when you were in your bedroom uh, coding Snort. Um, what are the types of problems, challenges you were trying to tackle back then, and why did you decide to develop Snort? Sure. Um, so this is uh, it's a little bit of a long story, but not too bad. So um, basically, in uh, in 1996, I moved to Maryland, and uh, you know my background is engineering. I'm a um, computer engineer. So um, I moved to Maryland, and I got a job working uh, across the road from a, you know three-letter agency, and um, very quickly got onto information security contracts as a contractor, um, and. So as I got into doing InfoSec stuff, I was kind of, uh, I was stricken by how many different tools there were, how many different disciplines there were, how it was kind of clicky, you know, in InfoSec there's like, there's different groups of people who have very different focuses who are really different cliques. And they're, they're kind of peer groups, but not really in a lot of ways. So there's crypto guys and threat guys and network guys and endpoint guys and vulnerability guys and researchers and stuff like that. And you know, they don't necessarily even hang out at the same parties. Um, so I was very interested in getting into uh, security because I saw it as a, uh, an up-and-coming field uh, back in the mid-90s. And you know, the thing that occurred to me is that this is something that's always going to be around. It's, and it, it's kind of a fascinating field. You have you know, attackers and defenders, and you're really trying to figure out what's going on. So one of the things that I did to teach myself uh, about security, because I felt like I was at the bottom of a very steep learning curve uh, back then, was um, I started writing tools. I, I went and looked at what other people had written and released as open source software, uh, and I started writing my own. So I wrote little tiny firewalls and honeypots and uh, port scanners and um, sniffers and things like that. And then uh, one weekend in um, November of 1998, I, I sat down and uh, I decided to write a new cross-platform sniffer. So I wanted to write a sniffer. Previously, the, the first sniffer I wrote had uh, run only on Linux, and I wanted something that would run on more than Linux. So um, I decided that uh, I would write this thing, and I would use a very specific library called the PCAP, which is a cross-platform packet sniffing library. And I fooled around for a weekend, and I put this thing together. And originally, it was called S, and um, for sniff. <laughs> and uh, I decided that I was going to release it after, after playing around with it for about a month or so, I decided I was going to release it as an open source system. Um, and the reason that I was going to release it as an open source system was, uh, um, this is, so this is 1998 now. Uh, Linux had really made the scene and uh, um, people were talking about it and excited about this new collaborative model for developing software. And um, it seemed like a really interesting way to try to develop software. So I thought, well, I got this little sniffer. It's kind of cool. I'm going to release it and see if anybody uses it. Um, so uh, this was about a month after I wrote the first lines of code. I put it up on uh, one of the big security sites of the day called PacketStorm Security and uh, waited for the, you know, see if I would get any email, see if anybody would download it. So uh, I named it at that point because it, by that point it, it was a sniffer, but it did a little bit more than a sniffer. I called it Snort. Uh, what's a sniff, but more it's a snort, right? Um, awesome, awesome. So I put it out on the site and I got a couple of emails and it was, you know, uh, kind of this doesn't work and how about this feature and I added in a couple of features and then I got more email and I added in a couple more features and so on and so forth and started to snowball and, uh, you know, I was writing in my spare time, I still had my day job, I was writing on a hand-built computer in a spare bedroom in my house and I had a couple other computers so I had my own little network and I had a... Uh, cable modem connection up the internet, and I would leave Snort running during the day and um, see what packets it captured while I was at work. I'd come home at night and go through the packets because back then systems weren't as noisy as they are now, and uh, people, there, there wasn't kind of this, this continuous stream of, of stuff coming in off the internet. So it was kind of fun, and um, it just took off. I did, uh, for the first year Snort was out, I was doing a release every two weeks. Uh, and I uh, went from, from zero to having just tons of people using it very rapidly. 
Now, in, shortly after in 2000, you started Sourcefire as a company. Yeah. And what would you say contributed to the success of Snore, and how did that help you in building out your company? So Snore was kind of a fascinating thing. So when I started writing it, I didn't actually uh, pay all that much attention to the uptake or any of the stuff you're supposed to do. Um, you know, if you've got a, you've got your new freemium project right out there, we, we didn't know about freemium back then, it was just open source. So I wasn't really paying particular attention to the download stats or user stats or anything like that. And I had a couple of moments where I started to realize that people were using this thing. Um, one of them was in the, uh, the, the uh, late summer of 99. I did release a snort, so the release cycle of snort would be, I'd crank code until I kind of felt like this is a good stopping point, and then I'd put it out. So about every two weeks I'd put out a new release, and, bundling up the releases and getting them going got to be more and more of a project every time I did it. Um, I was doing this obviously in my spare time, like between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. most days. Um, and uh, so I did this one release, it was like Snort version uh, 1.2. I didn't QA it very well. So I, I ran it on the systems I had uh, in my house and that was about it. And it looked good to me and I kicked it out the door and I went to bed, which is what I usually did. And then in the morning I woke up and I had like 50 emails. <laughs> it was like, it doesn't, you know, the compile's broken on this platform, and it's not working on that platform, and it's got a crash here, and so on and so forth. And I was like, who are all these people? <laughs> Where did they come from? Um, and that's about the time that the Snort mailing list started to coordinate bug reports coming out of this bad release of Snort that I did. So, fast forward a little bit, uh, in the towards the end of 1999, in December of 99, so a year after the initial release of Snort, I released uh, the, the architecture that we're still basically on today, Snort 1.5 which had all the classic Snort features of plugins and uh, modular uh, um, rules language and all this other stuff. And so I kicked that out the door and I got a job at a startup. They, you know, Snort in one year had gone from, from zero to being something a lot of people use and I got recruited to go work at a startup. Cool. So I went there and I worked and Snort kind of became a background process for a while and the startup fell apart and I was looking for what I was going to do next. So. Uh, Turns out being the snort guy was pretty lucrative uh, things. I had like no no shortage of job offers, but one thing that I learned at the startup was that you know there's kind of two levels of people at the startup. There's the guys who start it and they're going to make a lot of money, and unless it's like you know whatever WhatsApp, everybody else may or may not make any money. <laughs> so, so and I knew that I had a uh, good idea. So I was kind of weighing the pros and cons of going someplace that was already established and doing something interesting and bringing my good ideas to the table and maybe I get paid, maybe I wouldn't, or I could go do my own thing. So what I saw in September of 2000, I was trying to figure out which way to go and I saw, I, I got one data point that kind of like really made the case for, hey, go do your own thing. And it was uh, um, a survey from the SANS Institute. So uh, people familiar with SANS, the uh, SANS Institute, you, it's like a post-educational institute for learning IT and security and things like that. Well, in the fall of 2000, they surveyed their student body, and there was a bunch of different questions. One of the questions was, what intrusion detection system do you use? This is before intrusion prevention. Um, and it's multiple choice, because people frequently ran more than one. The store was checked 92% of the time. So within two years, from first line of code to this point, is less than two years, 92% of people who are doing intrusion detection are, are using my stuff. And it's like, well, okay, well, all I gotta do is figure out how to get people to pay for something that's free, and I've got a model here. <laughs> uh, so, uh, being an open source project, uh, you had a lot of contributors. What are some of the kind of more significant uh, contributions you think you got from people who were working with Snort? So, uh, from a contribution standpoint, the the smartest thing that I did was, uh, um, so the, uh, the Snort 1.5 architecture that I referenced earlier, um, it had a modular API um, uh, structure, architecture. It had three specific plugin points. It had what's called a preprocessor, where you could manipulate packets before they went to the primary detec detection engine. It had the uh, rules plugin, so I could extend the, the detection capabilities of the system. And it had an output plugin system so that people could extend uh, its vending formats and things like that. So one of the things that um, I realized in the uh, very early going when I was uh, building this thing was that uh, I didn't actually need, I, I didn't know everything that I needed to know to build it. <laughs> so this architecture was built so that I could add stuff to it later. But it also happened to be a perfect architecture for people who wanted to experiment with ideas around intrusion detection, real-time traffic analysis, languages, and stuff like that. 
Um, so I got uh, a lot of contributions uh, pretty quickly. And the contributions um, mostly gravitated towards the, the output side of the equation because uh, a lot of the packet handling stuff is kind of, you know, it's magic. Uh, how um, there's a big difference between writing a, a you know, real time network traffic analyzer and a database plugin, right? A database plugin gets handed an event right to the database, whereas a real time network traffic analyzer has to deal with evasion and attacks against the, arc, the logic itself and things like that. So most of them went into the, uh, the output system, which was fine. Um, but uh, the really meaningful one, probably one of the most meaningful ones that I got, and uh, it was kind of one of these uh, uh, good news, bad news things, was uh, a few guys from uh, Carnegie Mellon contributed a, uh, a database plugin. So Snort could talk to databases directly instead of outputting to an intermediate format and then sending up to a database. And the, the, the good thing about that was now all of a sudden Snort could go into databases, which meant uh, People started building projects around the data formats and, and making GUIs and things like that, which was cool. But the downside was that uh, the guys who built it weren't as concerned with performance as I was, so we had a bit of a, a, a mismatch. And it's not that they uh, weren't skilled or talented, it's just that they had a different focus. So this is when I realized that my community required some management and I was going to have to uh, do some curation on these uh, modules themselves and things like that. So it was, a, uh, it was really interesting um, how, uh, how I started working with the, the community because once again, these people all kind of showed up, and the reason the community got built, I, I, I spent years trying to figure this out. Why is Snort so popular? And what I ultimately figured out was there were no other real um, engines out there that were free that had a feature set, the full feature set that I had that were easy to use, because I, I placed a real emphasis on being easy to use. And I think those kind of, those three things, free, easy, extensible, were the things that, uh, that really caused it to, to take off. And um, yeah, once it got going, it, it really uh, it took on a life of its own. I mean, you know, all of a sudden we had responsibility. We did this one uh, release one time. We put out a new detection logic for us. So uh, Snort has kind of two pieces. It has an engine and it has content. It has the definition of a tax. Um, and we found out some commercial vendor was just taking our, our, our content, our rules, and putting them directly into products with no vetting process or whatever. So we put out a rule that basically would fire on every packet that came to the system and uh, very rapidly found out how many people were using our stuff and didn't think that was funny. <laughs> so. Even though we think it's funny. Right yeah, now. we can get about it now. Yeah. $2.7 billion acquisition later, it's all funny. It, it exactly. <laughs> okay. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about Open App ID? Sure. Uh, okay, so Open App ID is a module that we released uh, that plugs into Snort uh, earlier this year. So. One of the things that happened when Sourcefire got acquired by Cisco, so Sourcefire owns two big open source security projects, two of the biggest open source security projects. We own Clam AV and we own Snort. So Clam AV is kind of the Snort of the antivirus world. And Snort obviously is uh, um, one of the most broadly deployed IDS, IDS engines in the world. Um, so when the Cisco acquisition happened, you know, a lot of people said, hey, wait a second, Cisco isn't exactly you know, world renowned for their dedication to uh, you know, producing open source. And um, we, you know, I had this conversation directly with John Chambers as we were negotiating the deal, and uh, I talked to people inside security business group and basically said, so what about our open source projects? You can't shut these things down because you'll lose, you know, this, this is your farm, you know, these millions of people who are using this thing, this is your farm team. And if you, you know, you alienate them at your own risk. So we decided that we were going to keep going as, as we had been with our open source projects, but we were going to go one better. We were going to release some new stuff as well. And we weren't going to just release something trivial. We were going to release something important. Um, so what we released was Open App ID. And Open App ID is an application identification engine, an open source application identification engine. Why do you care about that? Uh, anybody here heard of next generation firewalls any time in the past few years? All right. So next generation firewalls, one of its key features is being able to identify and control application traffic. So the idea uh, with uh, um, next-gen firewalls is, you know, they do firewall and they do intrusion prevention, but they can also do things like say, uh, yes, you can go to Gmail, no, you can't go to Hotmail, yes, you can use Facebook, but no, you can't use Facebook chat, and I don't want you playing Farmville, right? That's what a, a next-generation firewall could do. So there were proprietary ones out there, but there were no, once again, there were no open source uh, application identification engines out there. So we released one that's a plugin module to Snort that we actually used in Sourcefire's commercial products. Um, 
and uh, and put it out for the for the community to use. And basically, you can use this thing to write, you know, essentially assemble your own open source next generation firewall, which there is no nobody else is doing. That, right? <laughs> so this is actually pretty major functionality. And there's all sorts of cool things that you can do with it, from characterizing how people are using your network and how much to uh, uh, doing, you know, straight up application uh, denial or shaping and things like that. So there's all sorts of really neat things that you can do with it. And we decided to put it out there. And we, so we did that back in um, back in February. We announced it at RSA, and uh, it was uh, it was very well received. Although the, the project's still pretty early, uh, it's in the early days. How's the growth been? Or have you been able to measure that yet? Uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been kind of modest. Quite frankly, um, we put it out uh, as a uh, as an alpha, so it's not in the mainline releases yet. And uh, the documentation is still under development and things like that. So it's still early days. It's like an early open source project. Um, I was talking to my, uh, uh, I was getting a status update because I saw this question was going to be there. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to see how we were doing. And, and the, uh, um, the results were, uh, were not as great as I hoped they would be. So I started digging into kind of what's going on with it. Because open source projects require curation. If you're going to like produce an open source project, it's not enough to just Hey, this thing is free. This free thing. Here you go. Have a nice day. You can't. You can't just do that. You gotta. You gotta interact. You gotta be the cheerleader for your own open source project, and you've gotta get out there and show people the cool things that you can do with it. And you've gotta be seen moving the ball forward too, right? The first year Snort was out. Released every two weeks. Twenty six releases in one year. That was a lot of work. <laughs> and uh, you know we have to start uh, increasing the, the the visible pace of operations with the, uh, the project. Uh, and, and building this community, you build your own community. It, it will it will show up because you get the, the networking effects and stuff like that. But in the early going, this is all our our energy has got to be expended to, to build this community that we want to build. Um, so uh, so we're working on that actually right now, um, and uh, I'm, I'm expecting that we'll see some good results uh, over the rest of this year. You know, it's interesting. You know, we just started our DevNet community back in August, and. Things like support forms and things like that. It's you want everybody to contribute, but you know, I tell all the people that work for me, it's like we have to be the ones in the early days. You answer all the questions. Yep. You're in there. You're participating, and it's a lot of work. Yeah. I would do. Um, so I was on the Storm. So the Storm Mailing List back in the late '90s, early 2000s was you know one of the places to go talk about intrusion detection, and I personally responded to almost every email that, that I thought I should. So from bug reports to how do I use this thing, to how do I configure it, to what do you think about this feature, all that stuff. I would typically, um, a night, write 20 to 30 emails on the mailing list. I, I wrote in, in uh, I think it was in two and a half years, I wrote about 3,000 emails on the, uh, the store mailing list. So that, and I'm not suggesting everybody has to do that. You know, I kind of had outside success with my project. So it just kind of turned out that way. But um, yeah, if you want if you want to have a real community, you have to be the, the driver of that community, at least in the early going. Eventually, you'll get enough critical mass that it'll become self-sustaining and it'll, it'll start moving under its own uh, momentum. But yeah, you definitely, you know, I tell the same thing to the developers uh, that uh, work on our open source technologies and everybody who wants to know about open source. Open source is a, is a two-way street. It's not just, here, here's this free thing. Please love me. It's, it's uh, you know. It, it's you know let's let's go build something cool together. That's what it's really supposed to be. And I think we're taping this for my team, so I'm okay. hoping you will like to see it here later. Cool. Uh, so open up idea. Are you seeing any new and interesting contributions from the community? I know it's only been a short time, but anything? Um, there haven't been any real uh, code contributions that uh, that I've seen. Nothing momentous, just bug fixes and things like that. Nearly going because it's not once again it's not uh, mainstreamed in the store yet, but. Uh, we have seen some application modules show up um, and, uh, and things like that. So I think people are getting comfortable with it. And as, as we develop more documentation for it and uh, it gets to be more of a concrete part of you know, Snort, once, once it's in, Snort's kind of like a, you know, like a Cisco ISR. Once this thing is kind of in place, then people start using all the features that it has. So it's got to be it's got to be in a mainstream release before I think the, the momentum will really uh, get going on it, but uh, at the same time, once again, it's, it's as much us as it is the, the user community. Have you seen any uh, threats or outbreaks uh, that the contributors of your community have been able to help with uh, as part of the open source project? Sure, we see we see all sorts of stuff. So Sourcefire has um, has this group called VRT. So this is part of the larger Cisco Security Business Group now, and we do a lot of analysis uh, from a variety of different. Um, uh, vectors. Probably one of the most high value ones that we have 
uh, is the Clam AV community. So the Clam AV community is actually a very, very large global community of people uh, doing uh, antivirus. And um, we get submissions of malware samples from our community uh, every day to the tune of several hundred thousand samples per day of malware. Cool. That we then run through uh, a process to figure out what's unique, get rid of stuff that we know about, and then get left with stuff that we haven't seen before, and then we run it through a variety of analytics uh, to produce content for both Plan AV as well as for our commercial uh, AMP products uh, and uh, everything else that, that deals with uh, malware or deals with the effects of malware. For example, if I run a piece of malware in a sandbox and I see it do an outbound connection to a botnet command and control channel, then I will tell um, Cisco wide all of our, our, uh, our reputation databases about it. So uh, WSA, the web security appliance gets better. CWS, the uh, cloud web security gets better. Sourcefire's uh, intrusion prevention engines uh, get better. Everybody learns about this stuff. We use this and we parcel out across all of our technologies. So uh, the open source contributions have actually been uh, uh, very useful uh, in making sure that uh, we're on the, the leading edge of being able to uh, protect customers. From, uh, from malware, and it's really fascinating the stuff that we see. We pick up zero days in there, we have automated processes that will go through all this stuff, parcel out the stuff that's interesting, sandbox it, pop up results, and you know, uh, there was a great example of a flash uh, zero day that came out uh, probably a month ago, where the whole thing was found automatically in the back end, two days before Adobe was even public about it, we had protection for it. Wow. Yeah, so it's really, it's very, yeah, it's very cool. It works really well. I mean, when you get an open source project working, when it's really working, Awesome stuff happens. It's really cool. I mean, you know, I, I literally went from uh, you know writing the first lines of code in my house to uh, a public company in less than ten years. Wow. Yeah, and and that is the power of the community. You know, yeah, I'm producing stuff and generating content and things like that, and came up with a business model. But you know, it doesn't work if they're not there. Um, these guys are our farm team, right? I, I say that kind of lightly, but you know what that means is, in the sort model, it's kind of like freemium. A little different. You get people when they're in school, when they're at SANS, you get people when they are trying to solve a problem and they don't have any budget and they've got an emergency. That's when they start using this stuff and they grow up with it. And this becomes the right way to do intrusion detection and prevention. And what that turns into is people go through their careers, they go, you know, they go from being engineer to team lead to you know group lead to director to you know VP of whatever or, or CISO. And these guys grow up with your stuff. You cannot ever alienate that community. You've got to keep those, you know, those are your friends. And even when Sourcefire was tiny, when Sourcefire was me and three guys operating out of my living room, we got taken seriously because, you know, we'd go into the same, we'd see Cisco guys walking out as we were walking in. And people would take us seriously because they already knew that our technology was good because they were already using it. So it's hugely valuable, hugely valuable. So we have an avid developer community here, out there here and out there listening to us. Um, what would you recommend that they can do to contribute to the community on Snort or Open App ID? Uh, well, get engaged, right? So uh, when you use it is when you start really seeing kind of room for improvement or bugs or coming up with your own content or uh, figuring out ways that uh, you know maybe you'd like to contribute modules to the system. Uh, any of those things. Using it is the is you know kind of the the core. Um, motion, as we say in Cisco speak, uh, that, uh, that the contribution community really needs to do to be able to, to be meaningful part of the, uh, of the whole project. And, and it can be all sorts of stuff. It doesn't have to be code. It doesn't have to be content for the engines. It can be documentation. It can be test harnesses. It can be weird platforms that we never see anyplace else. You know, we have, uh, we have support for token ring and snort because um, you know, there was a group of people who were using it on token ring networks, and uh, you know they added a module to it, and they keep you know they kept it up to date for years until they retired their token ring networks. Uh, just things like that. I mean, using it is the is the the best thing, um, because when you use it, then you get into our world, and when you get in our world, that's when you know you're going to start asking for things or seeing things, uh, and when you'll have the opportunity to start contributing. So there's a lot of people out there that may be interested in doing their own open source project out there, or getting into this. You know, they're they're hearing from you. It's very inspiring, um, and they're thinking, "Hey, I want to do something open source and make a lot of money down the road, or, or not? Maybe just want to do." Your open mileage source. may vary. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, 
Uh, what kind of advice would you give to somebody if they were wanted to jump into this? Is there anything, you know, I mean, somebody in their bedroom right now, just yeah. going, I want to do this. What would you do it? Can have a, you know, there's no substitute. You know, uh, shipping is a feature, right? Um, there's no substitute for producing something and getting it out there. You can think about it and worry about it, and uh, you know, I, I'm probably one of the uh, chief. Uh, suspects in this sort of thing. I spend, you know, sometimes there have been things that I've built that I spent years thinking about before I built them. Um, and there's no substitute for getting out there in the market, even though it's an open source market, there's no substitute for getting out there and and really paying attention, you know, the, the, um, the fundamentals that guys like Aaron Raymond uh, laid out in the Cathedral and the Bazaar uh, back in the 90s. That stuff's all right, right? Release early, release often. You know, do a release every two weeks. Doesn't matter if you don't have that many features. Keep the ball rolling. Um, do things like that. But you know, sitting down and actually going through the thought process and figuring out um, what you can do and what you can't do, what you need to learn more about, what you don't know how to do, uh, and, and just you know, stepping it forward step by step. It, it's funny, you know, through store and through Sourcefire uh, through the years. It never felt like I was doing all that much when I was doing it, but when I, you know, when you look back is when you see kind of this trail of accomplishment in your way. Um, that's the that's the real thing. So, if you got an idea to do something, if you have a scratch, you need to itch. Today's the day. Just get going on it because um, you know you're you're not getting any younger. Your idea is not getting any fresher. Uh, you know, maybe you'll run into you know some intractable problem that you won't be able to solve, and you'll abandon it and come up with something better. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've come up with, you know, running into the wall and then rethinking the problem because I know this approach isn't going to work and then coming up with something that works really well. Um, so I, I would say if people are sitting out there thinking about doing something or they've always wanted to try open source, it doesn't have to be something huge. Snort was 1,200 lines of code. The first release of Snort was 1,200 lines of code. I literally wrote it in a weekend. Um, and, uh, and it didn't do that much. And it didn't have to do that much. Um, there's all sorts of cool languages out there now where you can be really productive really quickly and you can make a lot of progress very quickly. Um, you know, it doesn't have to all be low-level networking code like I was writing, right? Nasty kissing. Uh, <laughs> but, it's, uh, but if you've got the idea for something, even if you're, having, you know, you're searching for an idea, just think about problems you've got, right? right? If you've got a problem and, there, and you can't find a good solution for it, maybe there's, you know, maybe that's, that's your opening. I mean, I'm still looking for, there's things, I don't have time to write code anymore, I have to, you know, do PowerPoint now. That's my thing. Uh, and um, you know, I look it's at just my big on PowerPoint. Have you well, noticed yeah, that? Yeah, SourceFire, yeah. Cisco. Yeah. It's all, it's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah same thing. Um, the uh, I've been looking for. You know, so here, here's a great one. Here's a free idea for you. So um, managing pictures on my Mac stinks, right? My wife's got a camera. I've got a camera. My kids have cameras now because they have my old cast-off phones and stuff like that. So we got, you know. Me and my wife and four kids, we got six cameras in the house, uh, and the only way that I can bring everything together is by making a generic family photos account and getting everybody to dump their stuff in the heck. That stinks. Yes. Why, why can't I, you know, why, why doesn't something exist that allows me to have kind of a multi-tenant photo management system? But it doesn't. It, no. Uh, except maybe in the cloud. My wife takes a thousand pictures of me, and I never get to see them, right? Exactly. They're on their camera, right? It, it never gets off. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, there's one right there. I mean, cool. there's all sorts of little, little things out there like that. If you use, you know, your day-to-day -day computing stuff, you're going to run into these things. So I had a problem back, you know, back in '98, which was I don't know enough about network traffic analysis, so I'm going to learn the hard way by, you know, actually building it. Um, and you know, and, and good things resulted. But there's all sorts of things that are in front of you, whether they're at your job or at home or whatever. Um, yeah, just get going. Cool. All right. Yeah. Uh, You've clearly done a lot of things right here. Um, started this thing in your bedroom, 10 years, uh, successful company, acquisition. Are there any things that you would say, ah, I wish I didn't do that, or I wish I did differently? Um, yeah, sure. Any regrets? Yeah. Oh, there's some. Um, I would say most of the regrets that I have are not technical, they're more on the business side. Okay. Um, you know, uh, find a good lawyer early it would be. <laughs> Be one thing that I would say, um, and uh, try to try to understand. Um, you know, we talk about uh, aligned goals and things like that. Alignment's really, really important. Um, not being aligned can be really destructive, whether it's internally inside of a company. Uh, if management team isn't well aligned, or the you know the departments aren't well aligned, you can have a lot of problems. If the investors and the management team aren't well aligned, you can have problems, right? If they have different interests, if it's 
makes more sense for the investors to sell, and it makes more sense for the uh, management team to go public if you're going to have you know trouble there. So understand what alignment is and what it looks like, and drive to be as aligned as possible. Um, that's uh, that was a big one. Um, the other thing was uh, this is kind of one of my. Um, and this is on the business side too, so, but free advice, right? Take what it's worth. So back when I was uh, a younger man, back when I was just getting going, um, I, I had uh, lunch one day with, um, with a couple of investors and a, and a guy who had been very successful in business over a very long period of time. And I was, you know, I was, what, 30, 31, 32 years old, and I was trying to figure out what the heck to do with my company that was, you know, kind of stumbling along and running. And I asked him, so, you know, what's the secret to business? And he was like, Hire good people. And I said, that's it? I mean, <laughs> really? Um, but I thought, I actually found the inverse to be true. Don't hire bad people is actually, is actually it. And that's, actually, that's a tricky thing. Don't hire bad people obviously makes sense, just like hire good people does, but it's got nuance to it. You can hire a person who's really good at their job, who's really bad for your organization, and that's, that's not good, right? We've had people who are very good at executing their job who are terrible for our organization because they foment and warfare between groups and stuff like that. So that's all on the non-technical side. On the technical side, I would say that you have to be careful when you are architecting because inertia is, is, a, uh, is a word that isn't uh, ready for a family environment. Inertia is a real problem in uh, software projects, right? Um, I see it all over the place. We, we live with it today. IPv4. Right, 32-bit address space. I think that's a factor of inertia. I was, uh, I watched, uh, so I presented at this thing in um, College Park, the University of Maryland, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was this new Google University of Maryland seminar series. So week one was Ben Surf, and week two was me. And it was kind of like, I go better the internet, dude who wrote snort. Right? <laughs> and uh, so I watched his presentation to see what he had to say, and uh, it was hilarious because you know. He wasn't saying it directly, but he was like, it was all there. It was like, yeah, we tried a 32-bit address space because it fit the CPUs that we were contemplating at the time, and it really wasn't a good idea, but we didn't think anybody would use this prototype, so no big deal, right? So here we are, you know, whatever, 30 years later, and yeah, that bit of lock-in on the old IPv4 thing, huh? Um, beware of inertia. Think about your architectures. Think about how this is going to scale and how long you're going to need it to scale, um, and how long you can live with it not scaling when it hits the wall. Uh, because that is something that you are going to run into. And this happens everywhere, right? This happens in all software projects. Um, they're not broadly scoped enough, or you know, people don't think they're going to be successful. In the early days of SourceFire, I thought it was going to be a train wreck. So I solved the problems right in front of me, and I didn't think about, well, what if I'm 10 years down the road, and now I'm selling Fortune 10s, and you know, this thing's got to scale. You know, this, this data management backend's really got to scale. Well, that's a different architecture than what I came up with 10 years earlier, right? So um, I, would, uh, I would caution people to be, you know, to be very cognizant of how uh, vicious inertia can be and think about it when you're designing things. Think, think about it when you're putting together your good enough architecture. <laughs> okay, good, good. Hey, uh, uh, let me open it up to the audience. Anybody have any questions out there for Marty? Anybody? Be shy. Sure, go ahead. So the question, I'll repeat it for the, for the audience and for the camera, is, is basically, uh, how do I prevent, you know, how do I get out the door, you know, how do, I, how do I skate properly, right? How do I get where I need to be, where it's not over-engineered, but it's also not under-engineered? That's part of the art of, uh, of computer science, I think. And, you know, one of my uh, guiding principles at, uh, at SourceFire over the years was that uh, perfect was the enemy of good enough. Um, you know, if you, if you build understanding that you're going to have failure, that you're going to have inertia, that you're going to have systems that outlive their scalability and things like that. If you are smart about how things go together, I'm a big fan of loosely coupled systems um, where the, the pieces kind of fit together. I, I kind of like, uh, there's a great analogy, and, and, and this is one that always struck me in the, in the, uh, the gun world. I'm not a big gun guy, but this is a, uh, uh, an apt metaphor. Uh, in the gun world, there's, there's kind of two major guns that we see in the world. There's the M16 and there's the AK-47. The 
the M16 is a finely crafted, high precision weapon for, you know, it does a great job, does all sorts of things, but it's this really finely machine tuned system. The problem is that it gets dirty, it doesn't work very well. The AK-47 is not nearly as accurate as an M16, but you can dump a bucket of sand in the receiver and it'll keep firing, right? So I like to point out the kind of the difference in de design philosophies between those two systems uh, and how that maybe translates to the things that, that we, we try to create. Yeah, the AK-47 is a successful system by any stretch of the imagination. It is a loosely coupled system. That's why you can dump a bucket of mud down the barrel and it still works, right? Um, you have to think about these sorts of things when you're developing software, right? How can I build a system that's loosely coupled but not so loosely coupled that it that doesn't do anything, right? That that is the the art to the science there, and that's that's something that's tricky. And you know, we all screw up. Uh, I've screwed up before. Uh, I tried to re-architect Snort um, with a multi-threaded uh, processing model uh, several years ago now, and uh, I dead ended it because I I designed a, uh, a tightly coupled multi-threaded model that. Um, that didn't understand where Intel's cache uh, architecture was going. And as a result, this thing had serious performance issues that were not solvable with the architecture I came up with. We fell back to the old sword architecture, this old AK-47 architecture that's seen trillions of packets uh, over the decades and has never failed. You know, say what you will about Snort. Yeah, it's not multi-threaded. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles that modern software has. It is rugged and reliable and it can take a beating and keep on going. It's designed to be attacked, right? It's designed with the fact that I know the guys who are trying to launch attacks at networks have my source code. And they know exactly how this thing works, and uh, I have to design for the fact that they know where, if I take shortcuts, they can see it, but I also have to design for the fact that they know what algorithms I'm using, so they also know how to tweak those algorithms to minimize the performance going through my pipelines and things like that. All that's factored in Snort's architecture. If you look at Snort's architecture, self-preservation logic that's in there and things like that, it's pretty cool. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. So anyway, um, I, I, you know, sorry it's not a great answer, but it's like, you know, know, know the difference between good enough and perfect. Go for good enough. Be loosely coupled. Yes. One second. Hey guys, can you turn on the mic over here? There you go. Yeah, one operating system do something. Uh, Snort, uh, so the question is what operating system does Snort uh, run on? Snort runs on everything. Uh, it runs on uh, Windows, Linux, BSD, OS X. Uh, it runs on True64, on uh, Alpha Machines. It runs on, it's been put on to, people got it running on uh, the old Linksys. Uh, WSG11 uh, access points. It runs, if you got a, a GCC compiler for a platform, Snort runs on it. So I can download it and play with it? Go to snort.org, yes. Okay, yep. Cool. Any other questions from our audience? Yes, we have one over here. So uh, my home network uh, sees about uh, 30 gigs of traffic every month, and I've just been considering just capturing everything on disk and do um, analysis after the fact. Is that a bad idea? Uh, so, no, it's not necessarily a bad idea uh, if you know what you're going to look for. Um, so the problem that you're going to have is if you capture everything, uh, you're going to need to index it, so you're going to need to be able to make sense of it somehow. There are some packet indexing projects out there uh, where you can try to do that. Uh, I actually have a, so Snort can be used to do that. I have a different tool that I wrote um, more recently than Snort called Demon Logger that's specifically uh, designed to do what's called ring buffering. So you can tell it, take 10 gigs of drive space and just continuously spool, and I can look through these uh, PCAP files at my leisure. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, uh, that's, that's not a bad idea, but the, the thing that Snort's supposed to do is make it so you don't have to look through all the packets, get rid of all the stuff that's not interesting and leave you with stuff that is, but it's a little tricky. So that is a, that is a method, people do use it. Uh, it's a little more complicated because you need to do this indexing, and you'll get into the space management issues and things like that. But it's doable, and, and you have much richer context when you do it that way, because all the all the fundamental data is right there, instead of getting rid of 90% of it and just leaving you with the things that we thought were interesting in this one flow. Yeah. Anything else from anybody? Western. Okay, one last question. What's your vision in Cisco growing up with open source? Maybe a company open source project comes to Cisco. What's your vision there? So, uh, so my vision for open source at Cisco, um, you know, it's really been interesting since I, I got here. People at Cisco are very, very interested in open source uh, as a uh, as something that we can use moving forward. 
open source is a fantastic way of getting your ideas out there rapidly and getting mass acceptance of them rapidly. And in the past, Cisco has been very uh, centralized around you know hardware, getting hardware out there, giving you boxes and things like that. But Cisco is doing more and more software as time marches on. And in the you know kind of the marketplace of ideas, if you want your ideas to get a lot of airtime very quickly, open source is a great way to do it. Uh, and it can be a, a very um, kind of almost like guerrilla warfare, where you, you can go in against an established player and put together a free alternative that has you know 80 percent of the functionality or whatever, or the core functionality that people need, and so you can get people's attention very rapidly. And this is one of the core tenets when I started Sourcefire around Snort, understanding where the value is for my customers. Sourcefire didn't sell Snort. Sourcefire sold everything but Snort. We gave Snort away for free. We sold manageability, scalability, performance, automation, and support. That's what people were buying from us. We understood very fundamentally the difference between what we were giving away and what we were selling. And if you build open source technologies that have that concept built into them, then you have a business model. It's essentially the freemium business model, but you can build a lot of really high value stuff on top of these open source cores that people will use pervasively. And Snort is a fantastic example of that because it's everywhere. It goes on anything. And the more of you, you deploy, the more of the problem that my company, now Cisco, solve, which is managing this thing, scaling it, and uh, supporting it. Um, so I, I think that Cisco, I, I got up at the uh, ELC, uh, the executive leadership circle, back in, um, back in March, and did a 10 minute kind of TED talk on uh, how, how basically we, we figured out how to get people to pay for something that was free uh, at Sourcefire. And uh, you know, people were really, really intrigued with it. The whole senior management staff at Cisco is very intrigued with it. So I predict you're going to see stuff happen as a result of that as, uh, as time marches on. And uh, you know, I, I think uh, if Cisco could be seen as an open source company, not just an open source contributor, but as an open source leader, that would, be, that would be great from a vision standpoint. I think that's an aspirational goal that's achievable and, uh, and also would be, would be great for everybody in the larger community. Great. Hello. And do you think open hardware will be something that Cisco will uh, I think that ultimately Cisco will start doing open hardware uh, if for no other reason than uh, open hardware is, is becoming a reality rapidly. Uh, and if you want to play, it's just like open source. Competing against open source is a nightmare if you're a commercial company. You're either a player or you're a target. So be a player. Great. I think, I think that's a great way to end it. Hey, Marty, I want to thank you very much for coming out to the DevNet community and talking about uh, your background and your experience and what you've been able to accomplish, so we really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your time, everybody. Okay.